Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, you have found our YouTube channel. Well, this is our Tuesday edition episode. I am so happy to be here with you. Today, I'm just going to be touching base with you, just kind of catching up with everybody, saying hello and saying, you know, how's it going and just talking about some current events. And, you know, I will tell you the first thing I want to jump into today is harvest. Harvest is going on all over the U.S. right now, uh, still harvesting in the northern plains. And so, uh, you know, that that is still going on. I've actually been recording additional episodes for the Corn Revolution podcast just this last week. And uh, this coming week, I have been doing that, and I've been interviewing a lot of folks that work for Pioneer up in the Northern Plains, Northern Illinois, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, and we've been talking a lot about the corn harvest, a lot about yields, and a lot about how harvest is going, and you know, we're, we're still going, st- it's still going up there, no question about it. As a matter of fact, uh, percentage-wise, I think there's still a, there's still quite a ways to go, and I've been following it closely. I'm, I'm I'm out here in Idaho. We raise primarily livestock, so this is not something that I encounter year after year after year, but it's certainly something I follow and just kind of watch in awe of. And as I've been watching this, I've been seeing photographs coming out of North Dakota specifically that just got hammered with snow early, and people trying to get their sugar beets dug, their potatoes out, other crops harvested. And man, seeing tractors just buried in mud, but desperately trying to get their crops out of the ground. And you just cannot help but feel for folks like that. And you know, sometimes I think in this day and age of modern equipment and GPS and precision farming and drones and and all of this type of stuff we've got, sometimes we might take for granted that Mother Nature still can have an unbelievable impact on farming. I mean, certainly farmers don't, especially those that are completely reliant on Mother Nature or live in areas where uh, weather can come in and decimate a crop. That can happen here out where I'm at in Idaho, but it doesn't happen all that often. It does occasionally, but not like it does in the Midwest. And so, folks, I just want you to know that even though I'm over in the Intermountain West, I'm keeping an eye on it. I've got you in my thoughts. I, I'm I'm watching it go on, and, and man, I, I definitely feel for you, definitely admire you for what you do. Uh, there's no question about that. And uh, as, I'm, as I was interviewing people last Friday in Minnesota and northern Iowa, uh, even in Illinois, uh, they had snow. Um, you know, they were the corn wasn't dried down to the level they wanted it dried down to yet. So they had a lot of challenges, this deal with, uh, with uh, LP and the shortage there and the need to dry corn and and all the stuff that's been going on it's just stuff that uh i you know what i i take things for granted out here in idaho all the time i talk about our vanilla weather i complain about irrigating but i will tell you what that vanilla weather and the fact that we get water to our crops through irrigation in my case our pasture our hay field i'll tell you what i i I, I am looking a gift horse in the mouth when I complain, and there's no question about that looking what's going on now. So I just wanted to say something on that. And as I've been following this, you know, there's always stories like this every year, unfortunately, but I wanted to share this story with you. Uh, the title is, um, what's it say? Pat Downey Harvest Day, Area Farmers Help Harvest After Pat Suddenly Passes Away. And unfortunately, there's stories like this year after year, but they're always very touching. It says here, when needed most, Nebraskans know how to step up, but no one does it better than those from small communities. Custer County had the opportunity to step up and help a family who needed it most after one of their own passed unexpectedly. Patrick Downey, a farmer and lifelong member of the Myrna community, died at the age of 54 on September 10th, right before the beginning of fall harvest. As fall harvest moved forward, the nearly 1,500 acres of ready-to-be-harvested crops remained untouched. It would not stay that wa- that way for long. A job that would have taken one combine 15 days to complete only took the small army of farmers one day. Area farmers organized a mass harvest that involved nearly 100 people, around 11 combines, 50 trucks, and 12 to 15 grain carts. And then there's a quote here. If somebody was, if somebody else was having trouble today, Pat would have been here today. Guarantee it with his combine and outfit. He would have been right here with everyone else, said John Smith, who helped organize the harvest day. 
And he went on to say, this is what we do in Custer County. So the massive event kicked off first thing in the morning on Saturday, November 9th, with the massive crews spread out across Custer County, ranging from Broken Bow to Anselmo. Hope I'm saying Anselmo correctly. John Blakeman, one of the local farmers and organizers of the Harvest Day, said, Pat was a great friend and neighbor to everyone that is helping today. My wife and him and his wife spent countless hours together of the last 30 years We had a lot of fun and meant a lot to me personally. And then it goes on to say area businesses also helped support the event with food, equipment, etc. Businesses and individuals that donated include, um, and I'll name them here, why not? Uh, It says uh, County, or excuse me, Country Partners Cooperative, Ag West Commodities, Brian Franson, DeKalb Seed, Casey Cooksley, DeKalb Seed, Nebraska State Bank, Plains Equipment, Grocery Cart, Gateway Motors, Roy Yana Gita, sorry Roy, hope I said that right, Shannon Cooksley, Anderson Group, Central Nebraska Insurance Agency, Heather Callahan, and Gary's Superfood. Blakeman said when the idea got out, people were calling him to donate their time, wanting to help in any way possible. Both Blakeman and Smith noted that there was nothing more impressive than seeing the huge number of people step forward and wanting to volunteer their time and equipment. And then another quote, uh, unbelievable, I am proud of where I live, said Blakeman. And I think all of us, wherever we're at in the United States, that have this dream of living our lives this way, it's stories like this right here, which are the reason why. I mean, and I was talking with this uh, in an interview the other day. As a matter of fact, I think that interview is coming up this Friday, actually. So you'll be hearing this interview this Friday. So this is actually a little bit of the cart in front of the horse. But we were talking about retirement. And I will tell you. I feel so lucky. This is one of the things when I look at when I look at the way I'm living my life and the values that I have, I feel extraordinarily extraordinarily lucky in the perspective that I have. And that is that my desire is to live my life, the rest of my life in a quiet rural area similar to what we're seeing in this story in Custer County, Nebraska. That's somewhere I would easily go, easily go and move to. And that is really fortunate because when you're looking at retirement, if that's where you want to spend your life and you want to live around folks like this and you want to live in a smaller, more quiet, agriculturally based community, someplace that kind of comes to a halt when it's harvest time or hunting season or, or something like that, man, you know, that's not going to, it's not going to stress you out to be able to retire in a place like that. You're going to be able to do it because people have different values and therefore, every price on every piece of property or every home is not inflated through the roof. But you know what? The reason I'm so lucky, the reason that I have this desire to spend my time and my days getting to know folks or living around folks in communities like Custer County, Nebraska, is because of stories like this. There's no question. It's because people that will come together, people that know their neighbors and will come together and they will do stuff like this for folks. And uh, I think it is I think it is great. And I know we've got neighborhoods all throughout the, the urban areas of the United States where people will come together in a crisis like this, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where a lot of times crisis is what gets you introduced to your neighbors. And in rural communities like this, uh, it is just everyday living that gets you introduced to your neighbors. And I like that. That's a, that's a value I like. So I wanted to share that story with you and just kind of give you all just a shout out, all of you who are trying to get stuff in out of wet fields, conditions where you're getting early snows uh you know my my wife autumn is down in texas today as you're listening to this she should be home but i don't know i'm recording this on monday so i don't know if she'll make it home or not but she's trying to fly out of texas and get back here today she's down visiting her dad uh, with her sister and they're having freezing rain and they're having flight delays and and who knows i mean trying to fly out of abilene you always got to connect through dallas Dallas Fort Worth, you just never ever know. So we're as I'm recording this right now, we're actually kind of in the process of seeing where this goes and if she's going to be able to get home tonight. So, you know, I, you guys are getting freezing rain already, snow, really cold temperatures. Um, you know, I definitely want you to know the rest of the country does not uh, does not ignore what you're all doing to get those crops in. So thanks to all of you, everybody. Well, and along the same lines of flying, so then uh, the day this comes out, I am supposed to be on a plane to Kansas City for the National Association of Farm Broadcasters Convention. 
First one I've ever gone to. Very cool that I get to go to this. Very cool that I get to be a member of this organization. I'm really excited to meet people and to see what the conference is all about. I'm excited to to see this world. It's not a world that I would have ever imagined myself being in. And I will tell you what, you guys, all of you who are listening to me and right now you've got a dream or you've got a hope of wanting to do something in agriculture going forward, I let me tell you my story, very truncated version of my story one more time. Those of you who don't know it or don't remember it, because to me this is a this is a moment. This is one of those marquee moments. Uh, if you go back, if you go back to 2012, the beginning of that year, 2012. Well, actually, let's do this. Go back to. We'll go back to March of 2011. So that's eight years ago now. So that's a little over eight years ago, eight and a half years ago now. Eight half, eight and a half years ago, I was living in the city in a subdivision, nice neighborhood. I had a city job. I was always in the city. I had no no touch with agriculture other than memories from growing up, my degree and my experience working on ranches and farms and in different aspects of agriculture. But we were living in the city, living a city life. And it was right around then that in some respect, I kind of hit a bit of a breaking point. It was like, what are we doing? We've been waiting and waiting and waiting to go buy a farm. Let's get it done. Now, we had tried, but we had never found anything that we could afford in the area where we're at, which is the metro area of Boise, Idaho. Uh, At least nothing we could afford that had any significant acreage that I felt like we could do something with. So we went out and looked again. A lot of things fell into place, and we ended up buying a 25-acre farm. So we have a small farm, irrigated farm, out here in Cuna, Idaho, about 15 miles out of downtown Boise. And that was eight and a half years ago. So I'd finally found a way back into agriculture at that point. So in 2011, it had been 15 years since I had graduated college in 1996. Hopefully I'm doing my math right. And finally I had found my way back in. And it had been, well, it had been 20 years since I graduated high school right when I first decided that I wanted to have a farm. So it had taken that long. But we had bought a place. Now, we did not buy in a working farm. This was not a turnkey operation. There was a lot of work to do. And if you listen to me, you know we're still even developing the place today. Um, and, and so we've been doing that. So I finally got back to agriculture in 2011. In 2012, and by the way, I was working as a police officer at that point. In 2012, I started a small agricultural business. That went really well. In 2013, I ended up leaving my full-time job as a police officer to be a full-time entrepreneur and running this small agricultural business. In 2014, I found myself so inspired by how I had changed my life that I started the Off Farm Income podcast. And then in 2000 and... Am I doing the math on this right? Yes. And then by 2017. So by 2017... I had started doing what I call custom podcasting, creating content and podcasts and hosting shows for other companies, DNB Supply, uh, Pioneer Hybrids, uh, National FFA, BulkLoads.com, these, these different clients that I had that I ended up selling that gopher business, that gopher extermination business that I had started. I sold that to one of my employees and I became a full-time ag broadcaster. That led me down the road to becoming a member of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters. And by the time you're hearing this, if you're listening to this on the evening of of the day it comes out or the next day, I'll be at a conference meeting all of these people, all these people from around the nation who make their living talking about agriculture, really getting to know the issues that are in agriculture and broadcasting about this every day. And I'm going to be there as one of them. Now, you go back just to March of 2011, so eight and a half years ago. I could have never envisioned, (laughs) at that point, I would have never envisioned me owning an agricultural business. I had no prospects to have our own farm at that point in time, and I certainly would have never, ever saw myself as a podcaster, let alone a radio broadcaster, let alone a member of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters. 
you don't know, all of you who are right now listening to this show and you're, you're, you're going, I've got a dream, I want to make something happen. You don't know what's out there waiting for you. You just don't know. Because I had no idea. I could have never, ever planned for this. And by the way, I can now look back and I can link all of this together and I can, I can connect the dots. But only going backwards can I connect the dots and go, oh, that's how I got to here and that's how I got to here and that's why I get to do this. That's, I can do that going backwards. But I could have never projected it back then. If, if my end goal in 2011 had been by 2019 I want to be a member of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters and be at their national conference if that had been my end goal I guarantee you I would have not drawn the path to it that I drew or that I that I followed there's no way I would have drawn that path no way at all so you just don't know what is waiting out there for you so what is the point in telling you all this well my point in telling you all this is that if you've got a dream, then start. Go for it. Do something about it. Don't just listen to me. Because it's really easy, but then it becomes depressing and it, be, it turns into this negative cycle that you can listen to a show like mine and you can hear what I'm doing or you can hear what other people around the, the United States are doing in agriculture and you can live vicariously through them for a moment. And then the podcast ends, you shut it off, you get out of your pickup, you get out of your car, you walk into work, and you sit down in your cubicle into a job that doesn't feel like the right fit. And you go from feeling good, living vicariously through whoever you just listened to on the podcast, to now having the reality set in of that's the life you want and it's not the life you have. So do something about it. Please do something about it. You don't know what's waiting for you. I could never, there's no way I could have ever, ever predicted what was coming for me. Nor if somebody had brought this up, I would have said, I would have got red faced and embarrassed and said, oh, come on. No way. No way at all. But somehow it is all, uh, it's led to this, which is, to me, is very, very cool. Now, this may not be what you want, what I'm doing. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what you do want, that life that you're dreaming of, or maybe a life that's even cooler than what you're dreaming of, is sitting out there waiting for you. That much I know is true. It is out there waiting for you, and it's just waiting for you to come along and grab it. It's just sitting there going, where are you? What's taking you so long? So get started. Go for it. You don't know where it's going to lead you. And uh, I do not take it for granted. This whole rest of this week, uh, I am really looking forward to. I'm excited about it. I'm a little bit nervous, but that's good. Staying nervous, staying, keeping those butterflies in your stomach is a good thing. Uh, on my episode of the Microphone Money podcast that came out yesterday, that's exactly what we talked about, staying nervous, keeping those butterflies in your stomach. So stay a little bit nervous, keep yourself outside of your comfort zone, but push towards that towards that goal, whatever it is, because what you may achieve is probably going to be even better than what you've got in your mind right now. So please do that. Now, there's a caveat to all this, and that is I've got four days coming up of this trip to Kansas City. I hope I do not get sick. Man, I have been reminded of my stage of life this last four days. So Autumn flew down to Texas with her sister to see her dad and her stepmom on Friday. And Hattie stayed home from school sick on Friday. And so she has been sick all weekend. So all weekend, I haven't got a thing done. Well, I, I let me back up on that. I've got some work done in the housework, but... I've got a pretty sick kid at home right now. So all week, I've been running up to the studio all weekend, recording stuff, trying to get ready for this trip, feeding in the morning, feeding in the evening, not doing a thing out on the farm, and then being in the house with Hattie and taking care of her and trying to keep her comfortable and, and you know, getting her food and, you know, liquids and, and all of that type of stuff. While Autumn is away, and she's away in Texas feeling helpless since she's gone and then Hattie gets sick. She, Hattie's getting better. It's just a mild touch of the flu, I think. Maybe maybe just a really bad cold. I don't know. But anyway, just the stage of life. You know, I sit here and I go, man, I, I want to do this with the podcast. And I want to do this. I want to write this book. And I want to I wanna make this website. And I want to expand the farm. I got a neighbor who I just saw the other day at uh, DNB Supply 
which we just opened a brand new one in CUNA, just right down the road from our farm. And I got to go work at the grand opening and interview people for the DNB Supply Radio Show and podcast, which that episode is going to air this coming Saturday. Uh, I really liked it. I think you'll enjoy hearing about our community and listening to people there. So I would tune in if I was you. iTunes and SoundCloud, everybody. But anyway, I got to do that, and I bumped into one of my neighbors, and he's like, you know, I think we're slowing down. I don't know if we want to farm our ground anymore. Do you want to lease it? And I'm like, yeah, because where I'm at, finding ground to lease is a challenge because ag ground is disappearing because of urban sprawl. And so there's less and less of it, but there's still a lot of people that want to lease it. Matter of fact, the less there is, the more demand there is to lease it because people that are out there that want to farm and raise animals or raise crops are still out there, but there's less, you know, there's just less opportunity for them to do that. So uh, you got to jump on that stuff. So I said, yeah, I am definitely interested. But then I sit back and I get reminded with Hattie being homesick and me taking care of her and Autumn being gone that my stage of life right now is there's a lot of things I want to do career-wise and agricultural-wise, and I get really excited about those things. And then I always get this kind of this slap across the face like, uh, you're a dad of a 13-year-old girl. You've got uh, five years left with this girl in the house. So your stage of life right now is, yes, work hard, do great things, but you can get unleashed when she goes away to college. She doesn't live under your roof anymore. Don't take this time for granted, which I don't, but it's always an, it's an interesting reminder when uh, you've got a sick kid at home and your spouse is gone and uh, you just go into maintenance mode when it comes to the farm and to the business for most part, uh, especially when you're trying to get ready uh, to be gone from the farm for four days for a conference like this. So anyway, just a reminder on stage of life. I don't know where all of you are in your stage of life, but it is an interesting thing that when you do have kids, I mean, they didn't ask to come into this world. You brought them into this world. So that that is where your focus is for the next you know, two decades at least. So always an interesting reminder. All right. So anyway, getting ready for this trip to Kansas City. You know, it hasn't been too difficult. I've got cattle out on forage right now. We've got goats over to neighbors, uh, some ground we lease. They've got a lot of forage left for the winter. A matter of fact, this is... Uh, you know, things look up, things look better for us farming wise every single year, it seems like. So this year, we've got all our cattle out grazing our alfalfa. And I, I mean, I look like I've got about a month, maybe two months off of feeding that I won't be feeding maybe till the first of the year. We'll see how long this holds out. But that is awesome for our circumstances here. And then same with our goats. We took almost our entire goat herd over to a neighbor's place. They've got a lot of forage left. And I don't know if they're coming back. I don't know if they're coming back at all. They may just stay over there through next summer. There's that much forage. So we will see. We may kit them out over there. I, I just don't know how that's going to go. Uh, but there's a lot of forage over there. So really, the way things have been managed this year on our end have, have been better than ever before. Our pasture carried more than ever before. We've got way more forage going into the late fall and early winter than ever, ever before. So uh, things keep looking better, um, and that's just part of the development, and it's part of the learning curve for us as well. Well, hey, you guys, I want to do this. Yesterday was Veterans Day, if you're listening to this on the day it came out, and you know, the military, I, I've told this story before, I, I was so close to going into the military, and I didn't do it, and honestly, I don't regret any decisions in my life. Uh, I have gone where I'm supposed to have gone. And everything, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I served. I, I didn't serve in the military, but I certainly served my community. I certainly put myself at risk. You know, I feel like there there's this interesting relationship between the military and law enforcement. Now, during wartime, during combat, uh, law enforcement on certain occasions will experience the same thing that the military can experience during combat, but nowhere near the scale, nowhere near the scale. And we do it in our own communities with people around us and the comfort of being in our communities, not over in some other continent. I mean, a whole other continent, a whole other country. But um, there, there is this connection between uh, law enforcement and the military, uh, especially people in the military who are in combat. And it's just... It's just something to. It's just something where when you go to work, you put on body armor, you arm yourself, and you go out with the knowledge that I may not come back home. Now, I cannot imagine doing it as a soldier and getting on a plane or getting on a ship 
and leaving my home for a year, for two years, for whatever that may be, and going to some entirely foreign land and not having any face-to-face contact with my family for that entire time. Uh, But there is something that um, until you have a job like that where you, you put on the body armor, you arm yourself, you get yourself into that mental state and you go out to do your job for whatever your tour is, whether that's a 10-hour tour or a year-long tour or, or whatever, and with the knowledge of you know what's at stake, there's a connection. There's just something that uh, law enforcement and the military share there. Now, I did not serve in the military. Like I said, I don't regret any of my decisions, and I've got that small connection to the military, but I always look back at that, and while I don't regret my decisions... Uh, because I came up with a very clear decision that I kind of put it in the hands of fate and fate led me into working in agriculture rather than joining the the military and I've talked about that before I I won't tell the story again but um, when I look back it's not a regret that I didn't do it but it's one of those things where I go well I'm 46 now those days have passed and you know that was an opportunity missed there's no question that serving our country. I, I've always served my community for those 15 years as a police officer and a deputy sheriff, but serving our country through the military is something that I missed out on. And if if I was asked, would you have liked to do that? Yes. Now looking back, I definitely would have liked to have done that. And you know, I would have joined, if I had joined, I would have joined in like 1991 to 1994, right in there. And I don't know that I would have made a career out of it, so I'd have probably only been in a few years. So honestly, I would have been in after Desert Storm and out before September 11th, so I'd have probably just served during peacetime. But it's one of those things where I would love to have that badge of honor. So my hat is off to all of you veterans, uh, to all of you active duty, everybody who's in the military or who's ever served. And I, I've got something I want to read to you. I My favorite author... I always talk about Stephen Ambrose, who died way too soon, but has written some great books, tons about World War II, Um, another great book about Lewis and Clark called Undaunted Courage, great book, Um, but I've read two of his, I've read Undaunted Courage, and then two of his books on on the World War II, uh, Citizen Soldiers, and then D-Day, D-Day is my favorite, and I've got D-Day sitting here, and I just wanted to read you this one quote, because it has to do with rural folks, and it has to do uh, with, uh, with farmers, with, uh, young men off of the farm. And I know in citizen soldiers, he goes into greater detail about this. Um, or it might be band of brothers as well. He does. And band of brothers is great too. Uh, but let me read you this. This is about the eighth infantry regiment, uh, that was commanded by Colonel James Van Fleet. And I want to read you this one paragraph. And I think it says a lot about uh, rural folks going into the military. In this paragraph, he's talking specifically about one region of the country. So here's what it says. The 8th had a good mix of people, thoroughly American. As Van Fleet noted, it had been historically a southern regiment made up of country boys from Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. He called them his, quote, squirrel shooters, end quote. They could find their way through the woods at night without being afraid and knew how to shoot a rifle. When the draftees began coming in, many of them were from New York and other other eastern cities. They knew nothing about weapons or woods, but they had skills the southern boys lacked, such as motors and communications. Quote, the marriage of North and South was a happy one, end quote, Van Fleet commented. And I've always liked that, and Stephen Ambrose has always done just a great job of talking about all the different young men that came into the military during World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor that were off of farms, that grew up rural, they grew up farming, and they grew up hunting and shooting uh, out, out of necessity. I mean, hunting for food. And, and not just for sport. I mean, obviously that's a part of it. But for legitimately, you know, we can eat pheasant for dinner tonight or um, that deer can feed us for a month and a half or, or whatever that may be um, growing up hunting and how good of shots these young men were, how proficient they were with firearms and being in the outdoors and navigating and understanding landmarks in the outdoors. I, that's one of my favorite parts about what he writes about. And he writes about that a, a lot. For I, I never got the chance to meet him or to talk to him, but I bet if I had and I asked him this question, that there's a special place in his heart uh, for 
these young soldiers who grew up on farms. Uh, you can just you can you can kind of just see that in his writing. He seems to spend more time on that. So I wanted to bring that up to you uh, again. Hats off to all you veterans. Uh, hats off to everybody in the military who's ever served. Really, really thank you for your service. Well, everybody, thank you for being here with me again today and for one of our Tuesday edition episodes. I very much appreciate it. Always love doing this episode. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.